Welcome to my session building the perfect BI semantic model for PowerView. My name is Casper Jong and I'm program manager on the SQL Server Analysis Services team. And today I want to show you how you can optimize a model, a tabular model for PowerView. What are the tips and tricks on how to develop the right model? And why would you actually want to set all those properties on the model? Uh, there are specific properties called reporting properties which allow you to change the default behavior and visualization of PowerView. And again, I'm going to show you why and how. And how you can set up a connection to the tabular model in SharePoint from PowerView. And you we're going to look at PowerView before model optimizations and after. And with that, I just want to go into the demonstration immediately. So let's switch to SharePoint. And this is SharePoint 2010 with our SQL Server 2012 add-ins installed, both the analysis services, Power Pivot, and reporting services add-in installed. And what I've done here is in my shared document folder, I've added the following um, in the library settings. I went to my advanced settings and I've set allow management of content types to yes. Then I went back and I've added the BI semantic model connections and report data source to this particular uh, data folder. And that allows me to create specific files. In this case, I've created three different files. I've created a BISM file and an RSDS file. And what do we have here? Well, I'm a BI developer at a telco firm and I've created a tabular model that is used by our data analysts group. It gives them more insight in the data about subscribers, products, geography, and invoices. Since the information requests are really all over the place, we have provided them with one model about profitability, to which they can connect with PowerView. This will give them a highly visual interactive exploration and presentation experience. So let's go ahead and look at how this model looks like. So I'm gonna look at my profitability model. I click on the BISM file, and this will automatically open PowerView and create a connection to my tabular model which is running on the background on another server. So the first thing that I actually want to see is how did my regions do? So I go to political geography, click on region, and for each and every region I actually want to see the number of units and the margin. But as you can see, this is a pretty straightforward table, right? And I actually want to see the relationship between those uh, regions. And if you want to see a re relationship between things, you want to switch to a different visualization. In this case, I want to switch to a scatter chart. So I switch to the scatter chart, which now actually shows me the relationship between different regions. But you don't even see which region. So let's make it a little bit larger and let's play around with the layout. First thing that I want to do is I want to add labels. So now we can actually see east, north, west, central, and south. And we can see east is doing best. Most margin and the most number of units. So that's pretty cool. Um, but this only shows me the total sum of all the data that I have inside my model. And I actually want to see it by date. We can do a few things. We can start doing filters, but we also have another option inside bar view. We can add a play X. So I add a time to my chart and now we automatically added a play X. So now we can see changes over time, but wait, I, I don't know, do not just want to see it by units and margins, but I actually also want to be able to see it by revenue. So let's drag in revenue and let's put that one on size. And now we made it from a scatter chart into a bubble chart where we now see three variables for each and every uh, detail. And now we can actually see East is doing better than North and West. And now we can play it over time. And now we see actually something ha interesting happening. And I can click on East because we saw the change, right? But what was the actual change? If I click on it, I can actually see the path. And I can see in the beginning, 
we actually had much more margin. And the number of units actually became um, kept the same, but still we dropped their margin. So that's pretty interesting to see. But again, I don't want to see the actual sum of margin. I want to see the average margin. I can just click on a measure and change it into average. And now we have the average margin. And now we actually see that the average margin per number of units is actually better at north. And we, wow, we see ease dropping and we can see things over running over time and very insightful information. And as you can see, I didn't have to do a lot of difficult things. I just was able to drag and drop and play around with my information. Okay. Now I want to look into more details for each and every product because this is by region, but we actually want to see it by product as well. So I go to new view in power view, which actually adds a new view, a second page to my report. And in this page, I want to see the device types by revenue. And this again opens me a, a table form, but I don't want to see in the table form. I want to add it in columns. And uh, let's add it up here. And of course, I want to see which is doing better than others, so I can sort by it. And this actually gives me cable modem and everything sorted out. And again, I just started playing around with it. I didn't have to do anything. Um, but again, I want to add the information by region, right? So I want to see the device types and revenue by region. So I can drag in region. I want to put it right there and I want to be able to slice by it so I make it into a slicer and now I can click on north east central and now you automatically see the values are filtered down by this specific region great so the next thing that I want to do is I want to add a product table I want to see the products but as you can see I have a whole bunch of columns inside my product table and which one to pick well I can just single click on the table and this allows me actually to immediately add some of the different fields inside this table to my canvas. I didn't have to pick anything. I made PowerView decide for me. And actually it was the modeler who decided for them. And I'll show you later on how we can achieve all these things. So this is by default, we're adding some interesting values. And we see a product name, an image, and we see actually something interesting here is we have two products with the same name, but we see them two twice, which is also something which we might want to, to take into account later. Uh, but again, I want to see products by device type. So I can drag in device type by tiles and make it wider like this. And now I can play around with my products by device type. And, but I also can still click on East. And now we see the numbers of product margins change. So everything is interactive with each other. Okay, great. So we've seen the number of product, but I actually want to see the products a little bit better. I don't want to see it in this form. I want to see it in the card index. And now we can see the uh, product, the product name, the image, the product rank by margin, and the product margin. Great. So now we can play around by device types, by net, by products, by device type. But actually, I want to see the product sales year over year growth as well, or year to date growth. So I can add more information in here. So I can add year to date. But of course, if you do year to date, you need to add something, right? You need some something of a time element. I can make it a little bit larger and of course I want to visualize and now we can see the growth for this device type group over the over a year I can actually click on DSL for example now we only have DSL modems wireless and it all is interactive with each other so now I can do VoIP modems but now only for central and everything filters down so that's pretty cool everything is interactive Okay, great. 
So what's next what I want to see? Well, actually, I don't want to really see uh, the region as a separate slicer. I want to actually incorporate this in the data. So let's remove this guy and let's start adding it to my information. So let's click on this thing and let's add region. And now we immediately see something interesting happening. Now we're dividing up my uh, revenue by region per device type. And we can do the same thing here. And you can see everything is just click and play, click and play. Everything just happens while I'm clicking and playing around with it. Everything is blazing fast because we have our tablet model running in the background, which is in the further back mode in, in memory. And again, I can play around. I can click on East, and now everything will be filtered down by East or North. So that's pretty cool. I can just start playing around and interactively playing around with the information. Um, but while playing with this, I see something interesting that more information that I want to add. I want to see per customer, per type of customer, how we are doing these sales. And I have a subscriber, which are my customers, and we have a, something called churn here. And churn means what is the likelihood that these customers are going to churn? And actually, I don't want to see make this into a slicer. I want to have this uh, visual experience. So I can do subscriber invoices. I can do a revenue. And I can make a new bar chart. And of course, I can sort by revenue, I want the best revenue on top. Great. So this allows me to filter by different types of products, uh, different types of, of consumers. So actually, you might be already seeing something interesting. All the customers that are already gone actually made up for the most of my revenue over time. So everyone who's left has made the most profit. And second comes my normal customers. And then our customers who are likely to churn. So we need to keep an eye open for them. And our most loyal customers are the ones who made us the least profit. Hmm. Actually, that probably makes sense because that probably means that those customers actually paid us the least amount of money. Which is, of course, if you can keep if you can be somewhere where you can pay the least amount of money for your service, you probably want to stay there. So that's pretty interesting. Let's go ahead and look a little bit more into more details about what these actually churn rates mean. So let's add a new view again. And let's start by looking per subscriber. And I have a subscriber ID here. So this is uniquely identifies each and every subscriber. And I want to look at it by year of birth and the income. And what do I want to see for this? Well, I want again want to see the relationship between those. So let's add a scatter chart, make it a little bit larger, and this is not what I want to see. I want to see year of birth on my y-axis, so I can drag it onto the y-axis. And now we can actually see that Subscribers are pretty much spread all out all over the place. But another interesting thing here is what you can see is on the top it says show showing representative example. So this means it doesn't it cannot show you all the samples that we have, but show you all the values that we have because we have about 140,000 different subscribers. So this would be a very very large uh, table. And if you show 140 dots in here, it actually doesn't show you the right amount of value. Okay, so what do we actually want to see? Well, we want to see the how these customers are actually spread out over, over the graph. So what I can do is I can add churn to color. And now we can start seeing something interesting. Now we see that my loyal customers are in the top right of the canvas. And what does this mean? Well, this means my loyal customers are the ones that make the most income, um, that have a high, very high income, but are pretty young. They're born before 
uh, after 1968 or something. So that's interesting. And but who are my customers who are already churned? Those are my customers who don't make who make a normal amount of money and are born between 1980 and 1968. Who are likely to churn? Wow, the person who are likely to churn are actually the ones who are uh, who don't earn, earn the most amount of money compared to the most other customers. So they're probably always looking on the bargain hunt. So where can I get my better uh, a better deal with another provider? So probably we want to do something to target that those audiences and bring them more to our loyal, our loyal customers. So as you can see, this is very interesting information, but let's add one more piece to the puzzle. Let's add products. Let's add my product name. Add it in here, product name, and show me the revenue by these products. And again, make it into a bar chart. So now we can immediately see that if we even click on something, everything again, if we click on my loyal customers, we can see that mobile is still on top, but if we do solid customers, we can see the, the amount of different things that we can, the, the different amount of revenues inside these things. So this allows us to play around with it. So that's pretty cool. But how did I get to this model? How do we get to this stage that the users can just click around and play around with this information? So in this case, what happens is, let's go back. Um, let's start our story from the beginning. In our organization, we have deployed SQL Server 2012 and rolled out Power Pivot to our analysts. One of my colleagues brought a particular workbook to my attention that has gained quite some traction in the organization. Since we have been monitoring the Power Pivot workbook usage in our organization, we have noticed this particular workbook is being used all over the organization. Apparently, this workbook is in big demand. But what does that mean? What does big demand mean? Well, this means that, let's go ahead and take a look at the PowerPoint workbook. So it's to the PowerPoint gallery. Let's click on my PowerPoint workbook, which the end user created and uploaded to PowerPoint. And this com information contains profitability, MPU analysis, plan performance, all of these things. But we do have this information in our corporate environment. Why don't they want to use our um, view of the world? Well, apparently, this IW knew exactly what users want to see, so everyone starts using this one. So what, what we can do is we contacted her and said, hey, we want to incorporate your workbook into our corporate environment. We want to base PowerView reports on top of it, because you can do PowerView re reports on top of this one as well. But as you look at it, this looks pretty different than the one we just saw. We see dim political geography, dim product. And if I open up the product table, I see IDs, created dates. We see all kinds of columns. We don't see images in here. Um, if I click on this table, it just shows me only product name. So there are not, 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 not anything else. So this is just less useful for, for our end users. So we want to make sure that the model that we create and the model that we give to our end users is much more easier to use. The lower barrier to entry of using this particular model should be as low as possible. We should help and guide them get along with this information. So how did we get this workbook into our corporate environment? Well, one thing that we can do uh, with SQL Server 2012 is we can create a tabular model based off a of Power Pivot workbook. So I've opened up Visual Studio 2010, I've created a new project, and I can choose a whole bunch of things. 
I can choose another service multi-dimensional. I can import a server, start a project while importing from servers. I can create a tabular project. I can import from server tabular or I can import from Power Pivot. And that's what I did in this case. So we used the model that my IW created and used that as a basis for our tabular project. And I'm actually gonna show you one step ahead. So I already imported this into my tabular server. And what you see here is, this is the project of tablet models inside SQL Server Data Tools, which is the new name for BI Development Studio. And this very much looks like what you're used to in Power Pivot as well. You see the tables. Uh, there are a few things different. Actually, this is a different color, pretty straightforward. But we also have properties in here, which is also different. But with the rest, everything is there. We have a diagram view where we can actually see the entire diagram. And everything that we know and love inside PowerPoint, we can also do in here. So what do we have in here? We have a few tables. We have political geography, subscriber time, subscriber invoices. And I've already prepared all these other columns. I've hidden some columns that are not interesting. And I've left the dim product table bare. So this is the one that we're going to optimize. So the first thing, of course, that we want to do is rename the table. I don't want to see dim product. I just want to see product. And the next thing that I want to do is I want to be able to hide some columns. And I'm going to switch to the diagram view for that. Because this allows me to make it a little bit easier. Because in here, I can multi-select. I can select an ID. I can set launch date, expiry date, type, launch date, expiry date, device ID. Those are all things that are not very interesting for my end users. So I want to hide the, all these columns for them. So do right mouse click, hide from client tools, and now they're hidden. Go back and you see every, all of them are of a different color now. So that's pretty cool. I've hidden all these columns. But while looking at this data, I'm missing one thing. While I'm playing around with it, I see some important information that I think I can add to this model. And as you can see, and I showed you in the first demo, we had a likelihood that our customer subscribers are to churn. And we don't have it in this model. And why is that? Well, the likelihood to churn is something that I built about six months ago for another project. So my IW didn't have access to this information, but I do because this is pretty. In, this is a pretty interesting project because this is a data mining project. There's not someone who has went in and looked at all the subscribers and hey, are they likely to churn? No, we've looked at it for using a data mining. So what we did is. We created a data mining model based on my data warehouse where all my subscribers are in. And we've clustered them into six different groups. Well, actually, data mining automatically clustered those groups. And there are six different groups which we have to manually name. So in this case, I named them by looking at the data that's inside. I'm seeing this is a loyal customer, normal customer, solid customer, open for churn, likely to churn, and already churned. So those are the clusters that are there. But now, this is a data mining model. How do I get this information inside my tabular model? Well, as you might know, all the things that are inside an analysis service are queryable. And the same thing goes with a data mining model. And because both the data mining model and the tabular model are based on the same data warehouse with the same subscribers, I can make a query that allows me to add this information into my tabular model. So let's go back to my tabular model. Let's do import from data source. Let's select Microsoft Analysis Services. Press next. Let's do localhost multi dimensional and select my profitability database. Press next using the service account. And now I need to write a query. Well, I have already written a query, which gets two things for me. 
which gets my cluster. So what is it that we, what is that likely to churn? And give me the subscriber key. So press finish. And now we have a new data source. And this new data source is my data model model. And every time I will refresh this part, this tablet model, it automatically goes to my data model model and retrieves the latest information. So whenever a subscriber will change to, uh, from likely to churn to a normal customer, every time we do a refresh, the data mining algorithm will automatically run again. So you will always have fresh data mining information inside the model. And we can see now all this information is here. Loyal customer, solid, open for churn, likely to churn, buy subscriber key. But one thing that I don't want to do is I want, don't want to give my end users a likelihood to churn column, a table. So I'm going to hide this from client tools. But how am I going to add this information to my subscriber table? Well, I'm going to use a DAX formula. I'm going to create a relationship um, where I use my subscriber table with subscriber key, and I'm going to connect it to my churn table by subscriber key. So I do create, and we create a relationship. Now I can switch back to my subscriber table and I can add this information. So let's do insert column. And now we can use a DAX, DAX formula to get information from another table. So I do related churn cluster. So get from the churn table the cluster column for each and every column that's related. And because we create a relationship between subscriber key and subscriber key in the other table, we are able to get for each and every subscriber the likelihood to churn. So press enter, and now we'll add this column to this particular table. We can rename it and we call it churn. Great. So we've enriched our model by something that only, probably only BI professionals can do. And we've added some more information to it. So we've cleaned up my product table. We've added some information. Now let's go ahead and take a look at it. But how do we go ahead and take a look at it? Because um, maybe you're familiar with Power Pivot, then you will know that Power Pivot always runs inside Excel. All the data is running inside Excel. How does that work here? Does all my data run inside uh, Visual Studio? No, because we are not able to run something inside Visual Studio. We have to run it somewhere else. And in this case, I have running, I'm running my, my project on my local machine. I've created a tabular server on my local machine, which allow, which has two databases running. First, it has the profitability model database. That is the database that I used to connect to the first time. This is completely finished. And I have a second one in here which is called profitability model underscore administrator underscore a very large GUID. And this very large GUID actually means um, this is a temporary database. And this is a temporary database that, that is there while I'm working on this model. And this changes whenever I make it, this change here. But because it's on my analysis services tabular model, it is accessible by, by all, everything that can access to analysis services. So this means this is accessible by Power View as well. So you can very quickly make a connection to your development database while working with Power View. So you can actually play around with this information while you're working with it. You can actually immediately see the end results in Power View, which is very nice. Otherwise you have to deploy every time, which you probably don't want to. You just want to make a change and see the immediate result. And that's what we're gonna do going to use right now. So the first thing that we're going to do is go back to um, to SharePoint and to my shared documents folder which I've added my content types and the first thing that I want to do is I want to show you what the difference is. So we have a BISM connection file and an RSDS connection file. So first let's go ahead and take a look at the BISM file. Edit BI semantic model connection and what we have in here is a name BISM, and we can connect it using a workbook URL or a server name. Workbook URL means I can point it to an XLSX file, 
which is a, a power pivot file which is shared on, on SharePoint and if we use a server name we want to uh, also give it a, a database name in this case I'm using my temporary database but what does this mean what is it what does the business file do well the business file uses the current credentials of the current user to connect to the AS tabular server but probably your AS tabular server will not be running on the same machine as SharePoint it will probably be running outside of the farm and as soon as you say running something outside of the farm we're gonna need one thing to have credentials flow through this is Kerberos so we probably need to have Kerberos set up to have credentials being flown through but the business file actually has an additional thing so what will happen we will try and you connect through the tablet model with the user that is actually being connected if that fails it will stop go back and try it again but the second time it will try to connect using the service credentials of the reporting services service that is running and using that credentials to log on to the machine if this user is being added to the administrators of the tabular model we can then switch to the actual user that has been calling so you can add the, re the RS credentials to the tablet model administration as administrators and then you don't have to configure Kerberos then credentials will flow because we can change the user that is actually being um, connecting under the covers to tablet model of course this is uh, a second option the first option would probably always be Kerberos but setting up Kerberos might be very challenging in some environments so if you don't want to do that there's a backout a backup mechanism which is actually pretty good so I have two things two BASM files uh, one who connects to the one model and the other one who connects to my dev model and I have an RSDS file and in this RSDS file I'm actually using to test my security which is set up on my tablet model and I'll talk more about that later on but what you can see here is I can add a data source definition and I can one thing that I can do here is I can actually set up to run always on the different credentials if I want to so this allows us a little bit more flexibility okay so let's go ahead and look at this dev model that we're using so I can click on it it'll automatically open PowerView to my temporary mo model and you can see we have the right names and everything in here so the first thing that I want to do is I want to click on region and we want to add margin and the number of units but this is not the same experience that we had in the beginning, right? Because we see a lot of different units. And we don't see a sigma sign in some in front of units. So what does this mean? Well, this means actually that the number of units are actually not grouped. They're not aggregated. We're just seeing the distinct number of units, different values that we had in here. But we actually want to group it. We want to summarize. Um, so the user has to do it manually so I, in this case I can go into my units can click on it and I can select some and this is actually what we wanted to see but this didn't work out of the box well this is one of the properties that we can actually set we can change that behavior so let's go back to our model let's go back to subscriber invoices and let's select units and usage I can multi select and we get all the properties in here and we see a property called summarize by and summarize by has set by default to default and default means give the client tool any opportunity to do whatever it wants we're not dictating what it should do but there are options that we can set we can set it to average distinct count sum min of count and we can set it to do not summarize and what does do not summarize mean well let's say for example in power of pivot if you click on the year it automatically adds sum of year to my pivot table if I were to set do not summarize on year it will automatically put the year on rows and not as an aggregation so we can tell it to do not aggregate so in this case I would do want to aggregate so I would set it to sum those two columns I can now go back to power view refresh 
and look at by region the margin and you can immediately see the sigma signs on both of them we can now see the sum of units and one thing that you notice what I did was I pressed the refresh on top so I refreshed my entire page because what is happening is when I refresh my entire page we automatically get the latest model definitions from my tablet model so because these things are model settings this part of you needs to know about it so we really need to start from the beginning we do have a refresh uh, report button inside power view but this actually only sends the query again so i can press press refresh on it and it only sends the query and it doesn't get the new model definitions from the tablet model and because we can do in things like model definition we can hide columns you can hide tables we always need to refresh everything okay so that was the first setting that we were able to do so what else okay let's go ahead let's delete this let's go to product let's click on product name and let's click on revenue and one thing you might notice here immediately is wow we have a few which has a very high amount of revenue but that is actually not the amount of revenue that is actually not correct because let's add product key to the mix and now you actually see we have two different products which have different same different revenues but actually called the same name that is very very odd so someone in our organization decided okay this is a smart idea to have two products with the same name um, but this is, might be very dangerous for our end users to use and the other thing what happens is let's add a few more columns and let's switch to let's say a line chart now the line chart looks very ugly we need to manually fix it up because again part of you didn't know what to do if you've added a lot of columns we're using a lot of columns but there are ways as a modeler that we can actually define this and make this used a lot better so let's switch back to my model and let's start making those changes in this case I want to go to the product table I clicked on the table and we have two different reporting properties here we have one called default field set and we have called table behavior so let's click on table behavior and here we can change the default behavior of different visualization types and default grouping behavior so the first thing that we want to do is we want to set the row identifier and what does row identifier mean well row identifier means which column inside this table actually uniquely identifies each and every row inside this table in this case it's going to be of course product key product key and uniquely identifies each and every product because you saw when we added product key to the table it immediately started ungrouping un unduplicating the, the columns that are the same so what, what, we want, what else do we want to do well whenever you use product name inside a power view we actually don't want to group on the same name we actually want you to use the row identifier under the covers to unduplicate those so let's go to product name let's, let's set that to keep unique rows press ok now we can go back to bar view let's do refresh let's go to my product table again let's do refresh again a little bit too fast so what you now see is we can see two different icons from the product key and product name so now if at product name you will see let's make it a little bit larger that actually business premium line is now two different products and if you add usage to it you can now immediately see that we do the right thing and let's add some few more columns and description now I switch to line chart and now we automatically know what to do PowerView automatically knows what to pick because we told it 
we told, hey, this particular column is very important, and this particular column is also very important. So these are special columns. So if you switch to visualizations who don't, who don't know how to work with a lot of columns, PowerView automatically knows what to do with based on the settings that I did. So this makes using it a lot more easier for our end users. And the other thing that we want to add for in here is we want to add the image, right? So we don't still don't have the image. So let's go back to our model. Let's do insert column. So we are going to enrich this table. We're going to add a column in here. So when we enrich a table, we can use calculated columns. And calculated columns are columns that are using a function are evaluated for each and every row inside this table. So in this case, I'm going to point to a, uh, a website which we have running inside our organization. It's going to be HTTP localhost port 81 slash and as identifier of each and every image we have product key. JPEG. And now this particular formula is being executed for all my different products and being stored inside the model. As you can see, we now have different images. Let's call it image and let's go back to bar view. Refresh, leave this page. Let's go back to my product table and now select image. But wait, this is not what we expected, right? We only see the same URLs. We don't see the actual images. And that is because, how does PowerView actually even know that this string is different than this string? Both are string values, right? So we need to tell something. We need to tell the model that the values inside this particular column are actually image URLs. So let's set image URLs through and we use the reporting properties properties pane to actually set this property. Let's go back, refresh. Let's get back to product. Let's select image. And now we are at it and we have those images. Ah, I should use the right URL string. Let's change this again. Now I can even show you what the other refresh does. Okay, because now I can do a property refresh. And now we actually have the images here. Great. All right. So what else do we want to see? Well, the last thing that I want to, well, one of the last things that I want to show you for those reporting properties is the ability that we had to click on a product name. So now we clicked on product, and now it actually shows you product key automatically. But that's not what we want to have, right? We want to see the columns that I picked as a modeler. So let's go back to my model. Let's click on product. Let's click on default field set. Let's go to add some fields like product name, of course I want to show image. What else do we want to see? Well, we want to see the margin. But the margin is a measure and I don't see it in here. And what we can do here is we can add fields in the table and we can move it in order. But the sum of margin is not part of this table yet because I don't have a measure in here that actually describes it. So let's start by adding a measure. And adding a measure in the tablet model you do in the calculate measure grid or calculation area. So what I now do is sum of broad margin. And it's actually the same as sum of margin. Press enter. And now this value is being added to the model. Another thing which is in, in, in important to do is set the formatting. In this case, I'm setting format to currency. And now this will show up 
ingress in this in power view as well so i click on product go to default field set go to some product margin add that to the list as well press ok it's updating let's go back to power view just to refresh previous page let's click on product and now we automatically see this premium line image and sum of margin. Great. So what else do we want to see? Well, the last time that we uh, did this presentation, we also switched to the card index. And the card index looks pretty much the same, but not really the same in here, because we don't, the image doesn't show the same. Uh, what we can do is we can promote some of the columns inside the table to be more prominently available. So I can promote some columns in table behavior to actually say my default label is called product name. And my default label image is called image. In this case, we only have one image, so it's pretty straightforward. But what now will happen is, whenever we go to a visualization in Crescent, and we have those columns in our matrix, Crescent will automatically know, hey, these columns are more important than the rest. So maybe we can do some additional uh, visualization with it. In this case, I'm going to press OK. You will see image change. Let's go back to refresh. Leave this page. Click on product. And switch to card index. And now you see actually images more prominent available. It's much larger. So it looks much, much more better. Okay, that's great. So those are the things that you can do inside a model to actually make working with PowerView much more simple. You can set the default aggregation functions. You can uh, make sure that grouping is correctly on the right columns. You can change the aggregation functions. You can promote certain columns. You can change the default field set on tables. Uh, so those are the specific reporting properties. But there are a few other tricks that I would like to show you. For example, I wanted, I showed you in the first of the presentation, I showed you uh, a year to date. So let's add year to date. So we do margin year to date equals, and we will do the DAX formula total year to date using sum of margin, where the date table using date. timetable, sorry, timetable date. And this is a default time intelligence function. Total year to date, sum of margin using time date. Press enter. Of course, it's going to use for some formatting again. It's currency. So let's go ahead and use this. Let's do refresh, leave this page. Subscriber uh, products, I put it in the product table. Margin year to date. And we need to add the time dimension, month name. Okay, great. Let's switch to line chart. And we see something weird in here. This is not a year to date, right? This is an actual. It's not yet today. Nothing happens here. So something is going wrong with our time intelligence function. Uh, let's go ahead and look, go back to the model and look at what is actually going on. So what you see in here is we have a product, uh, invoice table. And these are all the invoices. This contains the margin per invoice. And we have a date key in here. And this date key actually points to our date table. And in this date table, it uses a surrogate key for each and every row inside this date table. But that's where our core problem lies because DAX, as when you use a time intelligence function, actually needs to know where is a real date column because I don't know how to subtract a year or determine the year's date by looking at an integer column. I really need to know the real date column. And there are two ways to do it. You can either create a date value inside the fact table and use that as a relationship. That's probably not what you want to do. 
you actually probably want to point to an actual date type, date column. And we can do that. I going to go to table, click on date, mark as date table, and point to the date column. Press OK. And the other thing that you saw was happening as well is the month names are correctly sorted. So what, I did, what we did as well is you can click on month name and I'm setting sort by other column. So I'm sorting month name by the actual month number. And this actually shows us the right values. So those are two tricks that you probably want to use inside Power View as well. So now I can just refresh this refresh and now we immediately see the right value. And why could I use only this refresh? because this was a change in DAX in the Tableau model, not in PowerView itself. So now we have year-to-date values. So that's pretty cool. And the last thing that I want to show you is how we were able to set uh, security. And if you go back to the Tableau model, we actually have two different things here that are possible inside the Tableau model in SSDT than there are in PowerPivot. First one is partitions. This allows you to spread up your table in multiple different partitions to be able to process them uh, faster. You don't have to process everything every time. And the second one is we are able to do roles. So I've created a role called East role here and row filter, I've put a row filter on the table political geography. And this means whenever someone is a member of the East role, whenever you connect to this table, we only allow you to show the East role. And let me go back to my SMS and let's go to my roles, Click, double click on East role. And we can change the membership and things in here, but what I've done is I've added my test user to my particular role in SMS. So this is the deployed model, right? And here I, we created the role, but I can add members on the fly in SMS. Or I can change the role filter if I want to, but in this case I don't want to. Um, I can actually show you that this actually works. Let's go back, let's cl click on here, and let's do, and re remember, we've added my stored credentials in here, always run this as test user, create power view report, let's go to regions, and now we only see east. So this allows us to set the specific regions. Uh, security on the Tableau model. Okay, so this wraps up my presentation. As you can see, there are many reasons that you probably want to fine tune your model for PowerView. The first of it, the most important reason is it makes it a lot easier for your end users to actually start using it. And the second of all, it makes the quality of what the users are being able to use better because I can set my default aggregations. I can make sure that things are unduplicated. I can make sure that whenever user switches from visualization, we determine, predetermine what is actually being used and what uh, purpose. So that makes using it, the bar of entry to using this PowerView report a lot lower because we already predefined a lot of things. So let's go back to my presentation and let's take a look at how the architecture looks like. So there are a few options, a few, few things that we do here. So let's say we have PowerView and we connect to a PowerPivot model. So the PowerPivot model is being stored on SharePoint. So we save it to a PowerPivot web frontend on the web service. And the PowerPivot workbook actually is stored inside an AS server. Now PowerView connects to it. And when PowerView client connects, it connects to reporting service web frontend. And the web, uh, reporting service web frontend connects to reporting services app server, which might be on the same machine or not. Those, are, those can be two different things. And the RS server, when it uses PowerView, it uses DAX. So it needs a DAX extension. So it added a DAX extension on the RS server. And it, in the DAX extension, it able to connect to it to an analysis services uh, project that uses ADOMD.net. And in this case, we're using a direct connection to PowerPivot. So ADMD goes to the PowerPivot system service, which gets the data into my AS server and SharePoint integration. But if I use a BISM file or an RSDS file, there are two different things. First of all, if you use an RSDS file, it just straight up reads it from the RSDS file. 
But if you use a BISM file, it actually reads it from the BISM file, the IU80MD.net. And then it doesn't have to connect to anything in Power Pivot System Service, but straight up to an AS Tableau service running somewhere else. And this AS Tableau service can be built using direct query, which means whenever, whenever DAX is being sent to the model, this is actually not using uh, VertiPack, but it's actually directly passing through to SQL Server. So that is in short what the architecture looks like. So the few takeaways that we have on this presentation is you have seen PowerView on top of PowerPivot, you have seen PowerPivot on top of the Tableau model, and you've seen where the differences are. Uh, but a lot of the things that I showed you today are actually also possible inside PowerPivot. So you can optimize the model inside PowerPivot as well. But probably you won't you most of them most of the times you want to do it in the Tableau model. You've seen you can import a PowerPivot workbook inside a Tableau model, and you've seen how you can optimize the model for PowerView. So you can download right now the SQL Server 2012 RC0 image, or by the time you see this presentation, you can download SQL Server 2012 and start playing around with it. And one of the things that I would urge you to do is download the PowerView samples. So there is a sample set that our uh, a documentation team has prepared that allows you to play around and actually see all the intrinsic things that we can do with the model. And by this I, this, I want to thank you very much for your time. And I hope you have a lot of fun creating Tableau models for PowerView. Thank you very much.